Hello everyone, this is Drew from Animal Adventures. Today we're going to be going over all different North American animals. You may remember me from the last time when we talked about Australian animals, but this series will be going over all different animals that you could find in your own backyard here in North America, and even some directly here in New England. All right, so I'm going to get started probably with a smaller reptile today, and we're going to go through a nice variety. We're going to see some furry things, scaly things. Later on, we'll get to go outside. I'll take you around. We'll see some of our furry animals out there, and even some of our feathered friends that we have, too, that are from North America. All right, so give me one second to grab our first friend, and we'll get started there. Okay, so this is one of our more dangerous animals here at Animal Ventures. This one is a Florida snapping turtle. So snapping turtles are found throughout different parts of the United States and throughout North America. Um, depending on the type, you're going to find them in different areas. So around here in New England, you will probably be most likely to see the common snapping turtle. Common snapping turtles have a very, very long neck, similar to this Florida snapper's neck here. Um, if you go a bit more down south, you'll definitely be able to find these Florida snapping turtles throughout parts of Florida, as their name implies, and some of the neighboring areas as well. These guys are very closely related to the common snappers that we have. And you're also going to find down south the uh, uh, excuse me, alligator snapping turtle. Alligator snapping turtles are massive. The fully grown can get up to six feet um, wide, um, and it's going to be a huge animal. And they have an incredibly powerful bite, so you do not want to mess with them. Um, but where they make up for in a strong bite, they have a much shorter neck. So it's going to have a lot more jaw strength than that short neck, but they can't reach as far. Something like the Florida snapper or the common snapper can reach much further. So if you notice how I'm holding this guy here, I have my fingers aimed all the way at the back, far away from his face. It is the safest spot to hold him. You don't want to hold this type by the sides because they can reach right around and they'll definitely be able to bite your finger and do some um, severely uh, severe damage to your finger. You don't want to get injured by one of these guys. A alligator snapper, you might have a bit more success holding by the sides. If you pick them up on either side, their neck is not typically long enough to be able to reach you, uh, but it's still a lot safer to get a bit more of a grip towards the back. Now around here, you're going to see a lot of the common snappers, oftentimes maybe just basking near a wetland area. And if you are driving by, you might see one right in the middle of the road. So oftentimes people are going to um, think maybe it's a good idea to move them across the road. And that might be the case. Oftentimes if you see a turtle in the street, you want to move it in the direction it's already going. If you were to put it on the other side of the road, it's going to turn right back around to go back to where it was headed originally. And that's going to give um, them, unfortunately, a greater chance of getting hit by a car. So the best thing to do is move them right back in the direction where they were headed. And it's a lot safer to get a stick, have them bite onto that stick, and gently drag them across the street rather than having to actually pick them up. Many times when you go to pick one up, you might not realize just how long that neck is and they could be able to bite back at you. And if they get your wrist, it would not feel good. A finger, they could bite it right off. So it's gonna be something that's gonna be very, very dangerous if you do not know how to properly handle one of these turtles. All right, um, looking at this one's back, he does have a shell. So their shell is made of keratin, so same as our fingernails. So it's very, very strong, a nice protective shell. And you can see that this guy can reach pretty far into that shell. He can tuck his head in pretty far, really defending himself from any um, predators that might be around. All right, um, I, this guy is getting a little bit squirmy now, so I do want to go put him back before he gets too antsy. But we're going to stick this one back now, and then we'll meet a furry animal. All right. This next one here is definitely a favorite for many people that do visit animal adventures. This is a ferret, and ferrets are a type of weasel. And as weasels, they are extremely flexible. They can bend every way except for backwards. So backwards, that's about all they can do. Not much flexibility there. But if we watch, we can see this guy do a little bit of ferret yoga today. So he is able to touch his toes. He can bend all the way to the right and all the way to the left. They are amazing at doing the hula. So you can see that big old belly wiggling. And they can even, believe it or not, sit on their own head. So they can bend every way except for backwards. And if you have a ferret, it's actually really important to do that with them 
because it's going to help prevent arthritis, which is something that ferrets are known to get as they get a bit older. So you definitely want to keep them flexible. In the wild, ferrets are going to spend a lot of time going down into tunnels, um, and they're going to naturally be moving their bodies how they should to really uh, keep their bones and joints moving um, healthy and correctly. Unfortunately, in captivity, these guys are known for being very lazy. They can sleep up to 20 hours a day. They're going to spend a lot of the day snoozing away. Um, and in the wild, they'd sleep a lot too, but they're also going to have to naturally be more active. In captivity, they have everything given to them. They have food, they have water, they have shelter, toys, enrichment. So they don't have to worry too, too much about having to um, uh, fend for themselves and explore that way. So you definitely want to keep them moving, play with them, bend them a little bit. It keeps their joints moving exactly how they should. Now, another really cool thing about these ones is that they can fall asleep instantly. If you see here, when I pick him up by the scruff of his neck, watch what happens. Fast asleep, there's a nice big yawn. He may yawn again for us. So these ones have a, there's a big yawn. And then he'll wake right back up when I let go. There we go, now he's back to being squirmy. They have a special nerve in their scruff, and that is a way that their mothers can carry them to safety without a threat being able to attack them or injure them. Okay, so it's like having a, a special little um, superpower. So they can be carried off, um, no temper tantrums, and then their mom will wake them up when it's completely safe, okay? This ferret here, I chose him today because even though this type, this is more the domesticated ferret. You're not actually going to find this one in the wild, but there is only one type of ferret still left in the wild, and that is the black-footed ferret, who is found in North America, out west in the United States. And unfortunately, the black-footed ferret is extremely endangered. They are very threatened because of um, their diet. So ferrets are carnivores, meaning that they only eat meat, and they spend a lot of time hunting down prey that often can be much larger than they are. So the black-footed ferret's favorite food is the black-footed prairie dog. And farmers where they are found do not like those guys. They cause um, huge tunneling systems, which can result in destruction to tra uh, tractors, other farm equipment, even horses can get their legs stuck. So it's really destructive. Um, and that's just not, it's not their fault. That's just how they're supposed to be. But it doesn't work out with that human interaction. So many farmers have eradicated most of those black-footed prairie dogs and in doing so have gotten rid of the food for the black-footed ferret. So these guys are not doing great in the wild, or the black-footed ferret is not doing great in the wild. But luckily there are many breeding programs to help boost that population back up. And just recently they were able to clone one as well. So they cloned one of the first individuals of that species to try and bring some older DNA into the mix um, to uh, add to the population so they don't have too, many, too close inbreeding um, going on. All right, um, like I mentioned, these ones are carnivores. In captivity, cat food is gonna be an excellent diet for them, or you can buy a special ferret diet as well. Um, both of them are great as long as they're nice high protein. We also add a bit of canola oil, which is really helpful for their coat, keeps it nice and shiny and healthy. Um, one thing that you will notice about ferrets if you do get one as a pet is that they can be very stinky. So they have a strong odor to them. Um, that is something that's very unique to each ferret. It's almost like our fingerprints. No two ferrets smell exactly the same. And that is how they identify each other between other ferrets. So if you have a ferret as a pet and you give it a bath, they are going to smell 10 times worse after that bath because they're gonna want to bring back their odor. They're like, what'd you do to me? This is how my friends know who I am. So they're gonna produce extra musk to really stink themselves back up. Um, and it's gonna be the best, the best technique for them. So the best thing to do, if you do have a very stinky ferret, maybe they got kind of messy, you could bathe them. But a lot of people do what's called an oatmeal bath. Just kind of put them in some oatmeal and help get rid of a lot of that scent that might be um, kind of disruptive to you. All right, so I'm gonna stick this one back. All right, this is one of my favorite snakes that we have here. I really love this species. This is a California king snake. So California king snakes, as their name implies, come from California. You can find king snakes all over North America. If you go to Florida, you can often find one that has more of a tan pattern. If you go to Mexico, you'll find some with a jet black pattern that's very beautiful. Um, they're known as the Mexican black king snake, a pretty fitting name. Um, and really, depending on where you go regionally, each one's going to have its own unique pattern and kind of look to them. Um, king snakes get their name because they're considered to be the kings of the snakes where they are found. And that is because king snakes eat other snakes. That is a big part of their diet. So they're going to eat other snakes, even venomous snakes. They're immune to the venom of venomous snakes. Um, 
as long as it's a native species. So a California king snake would not be able to consume a, um, like a king cobra, but they could eat a rattlesnake native to California and they're not gonna have any issues then, all right? Um, so it's pretty amazing. One unfortunate uh, kind of downside of that is that they will eat almost any snake. And if they're super hungry, king snakes have been known to see their own tail and believe it is another snake. And they have been known to eat themselves. And if they do that, it's almost always going to be fatal for them. They're not going to know to stop until it's too late. If you have one as a pet, luckily, most people will be able to um, put it underwater and they'll cough, uh, excuse me, cough themselves back up. Um, it's going to be a nice little trick to get them to stop consuming themselves because many snakes will not want to eat while underwater. Okay, um, California king snakes are identifiable by this pretty unique pattern. They have this brown and white stripe pattern um, that you're going to see in a lot of the California king snakes. And this guy is wiggling his tongue a lot. Let's see if we can get a good look at that. There we go. So when he wiggles his tongue, that is how snakes are smelling. We talked about this a little bit before with the carpet python. These guys were gonna wiggle their tongue to pick up scent in the air. And they have a forked tongue, so it's gonna pick up scent on either side of their body and tell them if there is prey on the left side or the right side and where they should best go for. And the reason that works is because inside of their mouth, they have a special pocket called the Jacobson's organ that is a help, it's a helpful, um, sort of like a scent identifier. It's not gonna tell them exactly what the prey is, but it is gonna tell them that there is food around, which is very, very useful for them. Alrighty, um, let's see. If you notice how he's wrapping around my wrist here, kind of going around my watch, that is called anchoring. So when a snake wraps around you, it is not to be aggressive. That is a way that they can hold on without, um, uh, to hold on without falling down, which is really important for the more tree dwelling snakes. Uh, if you have a um, snake bite you and then wrap around, that is more that constricting behavior, which is not ideal. That's gonna be very aggressive. Um, and that is when they are trying to kill their prey. All right, um, snakes are an animal we never put around our neck here. Just a reminder, um, snakes are cold-blooded or ectothermic, which means that their body temperature is the same as the environment that they are in. So if they're in a warm space, they'll be super warm. A cold space, they'll be cold, and it changes back and forth as they move throughout the environment. And our neck is the warmest part of our body. So if you put a snake around your neck, um, oftentimes they're gonna give you a nice big hug because they wanna get all that body heat and then you won't be able to breathe too well. So not a good idea. The safest is to keep them on your wrist or around your hand because our wrist and hand is the second warmest part of our body and you can still breathe perfectly fine, which is gonna be uh, much safer um, for you and better for the snake because then they won't have to get um, injured trying to get them off of you. All right, so I'm gonna go put this king snake back and we're gonna move on to another furry animal. Pretty adorable. Let's see her here. This one is Nebula, and Nebula is a striped skunk. So let's see that cute face. There we go. So striped skunks are found all over North America. And you're gonna see a lot of them here in the Northeast region. Um, if you go kind of to different parts of the country, more uh, a bit more west, you're most likely to see the spotted skunk, which is a very close relative to the striped skunk. Um, but the striped skunk is the type we'll have right around here. And noticing this skunk, you're gonna be like, that's not a typical skunk, right? Because this one has a blonde color. So she is blonde and white. Most skunks are gonna be that black and white color. The reason Nebula here is blonde is because she was a rescue from a fur farm. So she was gonna be used for clothing, but luckily we were able to get her instead. Sometimes they'll breed these different colors at fur farms for specific reasons. And if they're born and they don't have a use for them, unfortunately they'll oftentimes be euthanized. But there will be different people that will go to those farms purchase them, and then find other homes for them. So we were able to get her and her sister. So we have Nebula and Gamora, and then they love the third skunk that came here with them, whose name is Star-Lord. So we have a little Guardians of the Galaxy theme going on with our skunks. Uh, pretty fun, makes it enjoyable. Star-Lord's kind of a jerk, but the two girls are super nice, which is always, always interesting when you go in there, because Star-Lord, even though all three of them are descended, he will still do all the warning signs of spraying you. So he'll first lift up his tail, then he'll pat the ground and kind of scratch towards him. And then he'll stare at you and his bum will also be staring at you. And he's kind of aiming his squirt gun ready to spray, but he can't do anything because he was descented. Now descenting for a skunk is a pretty simple procedure. It's done when they're very young by a veterinarian and it's a single incision and then they'll pop out the scent gland. And I, I believe they have two scent glands that have to come out. 
So it's actually less invasive than spaying or neutering is, but it's still, a, it's still a procedure for them, so it has to be done when they're young. And the reason they prefer to do it when a skunk is young is because a baby skunk cannot regulate how much spray that they're going to spray out, as well as an adult skunk can. So if a baby skunk sprays you, they're going to unload everything they got, and it's going to be pretty intense. You don't want to get sprayed by one of them. Um, if an adult skunk sprays you, they know that they should only do a little bit, and then you're going to be better off. That's very similar to venomous snakes as well. So if a venomous snake bites you, typically the babies will inject all the venom they have stored up, while an adult will only inject a little bit because they know what it takes to really do the damage that they have to. All right, since she is descented, there's nothing to worry about. Um, these guys here are crepuscular, so that means that they're awake at dawn and dusk. So they sleep most of the day and most of the night, but first thing in the morning, first thing at night, they do get pretty active. So that's when they will be kind of exploring and walking around. And the three of ours live outside um, and they have, um, they get fed first thing in the morning. They usually eat it then. And towards the end of the night, they'll, or beginning of the night, excuse me, they'll come over and they'll pick up that food again, get some more if they're um, still hungry. All right. Um, in the wild, these guys do dig a lot. They have very, very long nails. Let me bring those uh, nails up close for you to see. You can see how long they are. Um, right now they're kind of curled up, um, but she has very long nails that she uses as a shovel. So she's gonna be able to dig for insects and other um, things that they would like to eat, as well as make a little den for herself. So skunks are often known for sleeping in a tiny little den, the size of their body, and the only thing hanging out of that den will be their bum. So that way they can spray anything that comes nearby them and tries to bother them. All right. Um, if you do get sprayed by a skunk, a lot of people think tomato juice or tomato sauce is going to be the best way to get rid of it. But here's a quick chemistry lesson for everyone. Skunk spray is very acidic. Tomatoes are very acidic. So it doesn't do too much. You'd rather use something basic to neutralize that odor. So something a lot better to use is a little mixture with things that almost everyone has at their home. You can use Dawn dish soap, baking soda, and hydrogen peroxide. You mix all three and the scent will come off much easier than if you were to use tomato juice. And also who has that much tomato juice or tomato sauce lying around their house anyway, right? Unless you're prepared to make a lot of sauce, um, most people don't have that. So it's not something handy to use. And the other thing almost everyone has. So it's great to have those um, right on hand, mix them together, do it outside so you don't stink up your house and then hose off afterwards. It might take a few, uh, few rounds of it, but it will really help a lot more get that smell off of you or off of maybe your dog. Cats often don't get sprayed because they're too smart to mess with a skunk. <laughs> um, dogs get sprayed all the time and they get attacked by porcupines a lot because they love to greet each other by sniffing on the bum. And that is the danger zone for both of those animals. So it's gonna be a common thing for dogs to get sprayed or quilled by a porcupine. All right, and now that I've been talking about a porcupine, I'm actually gonna take one out next and that's who we're gonna be next. All right. All right, give me one second to get this big girl out. So this one coming out now is Aquila, um, short for Aquila the Hun. We love our puns when we can get them. Um, and Aquila is super sweet. She is a North American porcupine. I'm gonna grab her a little bit of apple as a treat. And she's great about not coming off of that table. Um, so these guys are amazing climbers. They are semi-arboreal, meaning they're gonna spend a lot of their time high up in the trees. Um, and they love to climb, especially in like a tall pine tree or other big trees where they're going to be able to hide. And one of the reasons that they need to be good climbers is because they are very slow. So although they do have over 30,000 quills on their body, they're going to need to be able to hide um, from other animals that might try to attack them because they're not going to be able to run away from those animals. And one of their main predators are fishers. Fishers are often referred to as fisher cats, but traditionally they are commonly named, um, excuse me, they are named fishers. They're not a, a type of cat at all. They're in the weasel family. So they are going to chase these guys up trees, bounce on the branches to try and knock them off of the tree. And if the fall doesn't kill them, oftentimes they'll kind of be um, stunned or they might land on their back. And then porcupines do not have any quills on the belly. So it's going to be a good way to kind of um, uh, attack the belly without having to worry about getting quills on their back or from their back. All right, and I mentioned that they have around 30,000 quills on them. What you're seeing right now is mostly a nice thick layer of fur. You can see I'm touching her fine, nothing is stabbing me. But if I were to part this fur, let's see, it's a little tricky to see. See all that white at the bottom that's now exposed? Those are all the quills. And what's crazy about the North American porcupine's quills is that they are very short, 
but they are barbed. So if they get stuck in you, it's like a fish hook. When you pull on it, it's gonna pull out of the porcupine but remains stuck in you. And when you try to tug it out of yourself, it's just gonna stay hooked. It's not gonna pull out easily. So the best way to remove a porcupine quill from yourself or maybe from your dog's snout is to cut it in half. It will release a lot of the pressure that's built up inside and then twist it out. This is still gonna hurt very bad, but it's not gonna come out as difficult, or it's not gonna be as difficult to remove as if you were to just yank on it as is. All right, so it's much better to twist after you've cut it and then pull it out gently, okay? Um, that's gonna remove it much easier. And a lot of people think that these guys can shoot their quills, but that is actually just a myth. They cannot shoot them, but they can release them very easily. So it is just modified hair. If you touch a quill, and it gets stuck in you and you pull away, it's gonna very easily pull right out of the porcupine, but remain stuck in you. Some porcupines, like the African porcupine, um, have much larger quills, and theirs are used more like a dagger. So when they stab you, it doesn't have a hook at the end, but it's a massive quill, up to two feet long, and those are gonna be a devastating stab wound. And they also roll around in their own poop, which will cause infection after stabbing. So no matter what, you don't want to mess with any type of porcupine. It's not going to be a fun experience for you. All right, these guys are the second largest rodent in North America, the largest being the beaver. Um, so as a rodent, one of their key characteristics is that their teeth never stop growing. So their teeth are always big, but they're going to keep on growing, keep on growing, and they have to wear them down by chewing on really crunchy things. So a big part of a porcupine's diet is going to be wood. They're going to be chewing on the wood of the trees, on branches, sticks. Um, it's going to help wear down those teeth, but also going to be good for their diet. And then they're going to eat a lot of other vegetation as well. So these guys are herbivores, meaning that they are only plant eaters. Okay? Um, yeah, I love porcupines. They're a lot of fun. She's really, really sweet. She's come a long way. A lot of times when they're younger, they're kind of tough guys. But if you interact with them for a lot of their life, um, then they're going to be very, very sweet. Or they could be. And she loves to be pet. She loves to waddle right over to people and investigate see what we're up to. And one of their favorite treats are uh, Doritos. We found that out with one of our old porcupines who unfortunately passed away. Um, and every now and then they like a little Dorito as a treat. She went to a college one time and we gave her a Dorito. I think someone in the crowd had it and she went crazy. So we do it very rarely, but every now and then it's good to get a little uh, tasty treat. All right, most of the time we're gonna give them fruit. Um, they love corn, they love different vegetables, and they get a nice rodent diet as well. Um, it's very, very hard and crunchy, a biscuit that's gonna be great for their teeth too. Okay, so let me get her put away, and then we're gonna meet one last reptile um, for this part, and then afterwards we'll be walking around all outside to investigate our other animal. All right, so the last indoor animal here is gonna be this American alligator. So American alligators are um, a very interesting reptile. There's a lot to talk about them. They are found in uh, mostly the southeastern regions of the United States. So from like Florida to the Carolinas, a bit more um, west towards like the central United, central southern United States. Um, and they're gonna be mostly on the coast and in the wetland areas. Fully grown, this guy's gonna get massive. They can get up to 16 feet long and up to a thousand pounds but most on average will be anywhere from eight to 12 feet long and still pretty heavy, maybe 800 pounds or so. All right, um, crocodiles can get larger. Some have been reported hitting 20 feet long, 2000 pounds. So it's really gonna be a big drastic difference in their overall size when they are fully grown. This one here is probably about three years old. The best way to guess is by looking at their length. So an alligator when they're young grows about one foot per year for the first six years or so. After that, it's a much more gradual growth until they're that full grown size. And they're gonna grow their entire life. So they don't have like a, a big growth spurt and then they're all done. They're gonna keep on constantly growing. Although the first few years are gonna be a big part of their initial growth, okay? If we look at this guy's face, there's a few things to talk about. First of all, the obvious, he does have some tape on him. We use electrical tape, which does not hurt this guy at all. Um, electrical tape and medical tape are the only two tapes you're going to want to use to secure an alligator's mouth so they do not bite you. Um, if you use duct tape, it's so sticky that that will really damage their mouth. Looking at the eyes, they have a vertical pupil. A vertical pupil is going to be better for a more nocturnal animal because it's going to allow more light in. So this is going to really help them to hunt at nighttime. If you look at all those little polka dots on the snout, those are sensors. That's what will really get damaged by the other types of tape with a stickier glue or adhesive to them. Now, let me show you what's really interesting about those eyes. 
If you brush over an alligator's eyes, they sink into the head and then they blink sideways. Let's see if you guys can notice that. It's very quick, but you might be able to see it a bit. So they have an extra eyelid that's going across called the nictitating membrane. And that is a clear eyelid that they can see right through. So when they're underwater, they'll actually be able to close that one eyelid independently of the other two, and they'll be able to use it as goggles and see right through the water really aids in searching for prey, as well as just searching for a spot to lay down or kind of um, uh, find uh, kind of anything. It's gonna really help them just like wearing goggles when we go underwater. All right, um, on their back, they have all of these bumps. These are called osteoderms. And as they age, they become harder and harder. And I'd say at about eight feet long and um, over, it's gonna be the hardest that it can get and they'll be completely bulletproof on their back. Other than a little dent here at the base of the skull, that's kind of their Achilles heel, but everywhere else on the back, a bullet will ricochet right off of them. Some of the differences between crocodiles and alligators. Um, an alligator is a little bit smaller. That's one we already talked about. Crocodiles are a bit larger. Um, crocodiles are found um, kind of mostly, there's a lot of them um, in uh, parts of Africa. Uh, there's some in Australia, some in South America. We do have one that's found in North America, the American alligator, and, or excuse me, American crocodile. Um, and they do have one area in the southern bit of Florida where they overlap. These guys are only found in North America. And then there are, um, there's one other type of alligator, the Chinese alligator found in China, all right? Another difference is the shape of their snout. Alligators have a U-shaped snout, it's very broad, while crocodiles have a pointy V-shaped snout. Their teeth are a bit different. You typically do not see alligator teeth. These ones have more of an overbite. So you'll, if you do see any teeth at all, it'll mostly be those top teeth. Crocodiles have interlocking teeth. So all the way around the mouth, you're gonna notice those teeth um, kind of side by side. It makes a very creepy grin, um, but the alligators almost have more of a smiley face to them. And then the biggest difference is probably their personality. So if you see an alligator in the wild, they rarely attack people. The only times they ever do are usually one. If you feed a wild alligator, you're gonna take away its fear of people and it's gonna be expecting a snack from you the next time you see it. So if you don't have a snack, you will be the snack. So you don't wanna feed a wild alligator. Um, the other reason it may attack is if it's a mother alligator protecting their young. So they're one of the only maternal reptiles, meaning they will fight to the death for any baby in the area, even if it's not their own. Unfortunately, the father alligators, if they hear a baby crying, they run over to the baby and they'll eat it. So they're not paternal. They are not nice to the babies, but the mothers will protect their babies um, no matter what. They really will fight to the death for their babies. Crocodiles are gonna attack you no matter what. So that's a huge difference between the two of them. Now, if we look at this guy's tail and the legs, he's got a nice thick tail. That's gonna be very muscular. And when they do their swimming, it's mostly all done with that tail. And they do have webbed feet, but those webbed feet, interestingly, are not often used for swimming. When they swim, they'll just tuck those to the side and the webbed feet act more as a shovel for the alligator. So as they're out on the land, they will dig for a few different reasons. One of the main ones is to make a nest for their young. Another major reason is if there's ever a drought, alligators are known to dig what's called a gator hole. Not a super original name, but they will get, uh, dig a big hole and it's gonna be deep enough that they're gonna keep on digging until water flows into it. So these guys will create a mini oasis where there's no other water. So you might see a whole dry landscape in parts of Florida or other states during the dry seasons. And then you'll see just out of nowhere, there's a pocket of water and all the animals are utilizing it. And that is all because of alligators. They will dig these holes and they'll pop up in all different areas to really benefit themselves, but other animals will take advantage of them as well. All right, so that is the American alligator. All right, so out here is Sheba. Sheba is our red fox. So red foxes are found all over North America, um, but you're actually gonna see a lot of them right here in New England. They're a very prominent species to find around here. And red fox are traditionally much more red than Sheba here is, but she's what's known as a ranch fox. So it's a variety of red fox that have a much lighter, almost blonde coloration to them. Um, it's just, uh, it's almost like a Labrador retriever, how you can find different colored foxes, similar to like the different colored Labrador retrievers. They just vary depending on um, their genetics. But if looking at her, a good way to know that she is definitely a red fox. Of course she hides her tail now, but um, on the tip of their tail, I'm gonna get a little closer. They are all white. 
so they have a white tip to their tail and that is a key red fox characteristic if you notice that she's looking a little patchy right now that's because it's starting to get nice out so that's a good indicator a lot of times animals will tell you that the seasons are changing she is shedding most of that winter fur and she's putting on her or getting her thinner summer coat and that's going to be a lot cooler for her in the summer rather than the nice thick coat that she puts on for the winter and the cold months so she's one of the animals we have here at animal ventures that can stay outside all winter and she actually likes the snow um, they're going to get so uh, densely coated that it's going to be nice and um, kind of refreshing for them to have that snow. They love to roll around in it, play in it. Uh, when they have some ice, sometimes it's fun for them to play with that as well. So uh, they're a very interesting species. When you have a red fox in your yard, you can tell for a couple reasons. Sometimes they're very vocal. Red fox do a well-known scream that's pretty intimidating, especially the females. It's usually called the siren scream, and it's, a, it's intense. It's very, very loud, and it sounds kind of eerie, almost like a screaming baby. So that's what a lot of people um, recognize them as. Many people think it is the fisher, but it's actually usually the red fox. Um, another way to tell that they, you may have one in your yard is because they have a strong scent. Red foxes urinate to mark their territory, and their urine smells almost identical to skunk spray. But if you smell it in your yard for 30 days or any sort of long period of time, you probably have a fox den rather than skunk because a skunk spray will dissipate after a few days. Unless it was hit by a car, it might last a little bit longer, but even then it does not last nearly as long as a fox's scent because they're gonna constantly be remarking their territory. Now Shiba here does not really enjoy being pet by us. That's fine. So we just uh, let her have her distance, but she is not threatened or stressed by us. So she's a great animal where we can come right in her enclosure. She's just gonna walk around, do her thing. She always has an eye on us just to make sure, but she's not one that we're gonna go over and pick up and pet or anything like that. That's totally fine. Each animal has their own personality and we're not gonna question it. All right, so this is Sheba the red fox. We are gonna see another red fox who has a much grayer color. That's because she is a pearl fox. So that's who we're gonna go check out next. We just met Sheba, who was one of our red foxes. And this here, who is being a little crazy right now, is Arrow. And Arrow is what's known as a pearl fox. So pearl fox are much grayer in color. They almost look more like a silver fox, um, but they are genetically a red fox. So a way you can tell, just like how we talked about with Sheba, if you look at her tail, which she's wagging, she's very excitable, it is all white at the tip. So that is a good way to tell that genetically she is a red fox, even though she looks much more like a silver fox or a gray fox. And she's still just a baby. She's very young, only about a year old. So she is super high energy. She's got a lot of energy she likes to burn. She loves to play with us, she loves to play fetch. She really is pretty social. So this is one that unlike Sheba the Red Fox, she loves to come over. She loves to be interacted with, pet, everything like that. So she's definitely, a, I would say, a favorite here because she just loves to run around and say hi to everyone. She's always the first one to greet you when you come to the backyard. We have a lot of our larger um, animals that can manage the um, all of the seasons. So she really, really loves the snow. The snow is one of her favorites. Now these guys here are not typically found in the wild. They're often bred in captivity. One reason is for the um, fur trade. Unfortunately, pearl foxes are very sought after for their beautiful coat. So they will use them to breed, um, they'll breed many, many of them, and they will use them for um, the fur trade, which includes like jackets, coats, the lining of um, maybe boots and other uh, shoes and garments. Um, so it's really, there's a, um, a number of uses for their fur. You can see how sweet she is. She really loves to come over and um, say hi to everyone. All right. Um, the other reason that these guys are usually bred in captivity is for the pet trade. So they are currently getting a bit more popular. People are trying to domesticate them to have as pets. And I don't think that they're fully there yet. These guys are definitely um, can have a strong bite. They are very high energy and they're not going to be the best fit for everyone, but some people will have luck with them. Um, and I don't know if it's something that is um, fully ready to be a pet yet. Okay, we got this girl here as a young baby. She was almost going to go to the fur trade, but luckily we got her instead. She got to have a nice life with us where she is very, very loved. We all really love to hang out with Arrow here. She's a lot of fun. All right, so that was Arrow, the pearl fox, who genetically is just a red fox.
This next one's pretty adorable. This is Blaze. Blaze is our raccoon. So Blaze came to live with us um, from a rehabber who had him because he actually has some damage to one of his eyes. So that eye is not functioning. So he's an animal that would not survive well in the wild. Um, so Blaze is a pretty interesting case, but he is very curious, very sweet. He's one that we don't pick up too much because they can be kind of bitey. They're known to not always be uh, the most handleable, but he is awesome with what he does. So he is a super energetic, curious boy. He loves to climb along his enclosure. This shelf up here is his favorite spot. So when I just came in here to find him, I knew exactly where to look. He was definitely going to be there. Now, raccoons are sometimes a concern for people because they are a very high rabies vector. A vector is an animal that carries a disease. So uh, a rabies vector is one who really will carry rabies. So a bite from a wild raccoon is not something you want to take lightly, especially if it's on you or a pet. You definitely want to get a med uh, medical attention right away because they, they could be pretty severe if they do have rabies. You do not want to contract that from a raccoon. Um, so it's an animal you really got to be very cautious with. Raccoons are amazing climbers. They're gonna spend a lot of time going in trees. And people often refer to them as trash pandas because they love to raid people's trashes and they have a similar face to a panda. Um, and they definitely will. They're gonna be little scavengers. They're gonna take whatever they can get. But something pretty adorable about them is that whenever they eat their food, they always wanna wash it first. So when you give them a nice big bowl of water in captivity, they'll run the handfuls of their food over to it, dunk it under the water, and then eat it once it's nice and clean. In the wild, they'll do that with a stream or another body of water as well, even a puddle. They wanna get um, that food nice and clean for them. So it's got a, um, it's just an interesting characteristic for raccoons. All right, so this was Blaze the Raccoon. This bird here is a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks are found all over North America and also right here in the New England area. So this is one that you have likely seen if you've ever seen a hawk flying by. While we do have a few different types of hawks in the area, this is probably the most common to see and they're easily distinguished because of their red tail. So if this guy turns around, oh, that was almost like our command. Uh, he has a nice red tail all the way in the back. Um, that is key for the red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks are also known for their sound. They do a very, very loud, intimidating scream. So if you've ever watched a movie and they have a really dramatic bird call in it, like a, a huge like haw sound, that is actually from a red-tailed hawk. They use it for most different birds in movies because it is so cool sounding that they're like, you know what, people might not notice. This is just gonna sound so intense that it works perfectly for us. So they're gonna use that sound for everything. We got this one um, about a year ago from Georgia. So he came to us because he was likely hit by a car. It's tough to say exactly what causes injuries, but if he rotates his head, you'll notice that his right eye is present, but almost completely missing. So he cannot see with it. It is not a functioning eye. Um, so he would not survive well out in the wild. These ones here, they're very clumsy, uh, but it's also because of that, he does not have the best balance anymore. He's missing that, that vision on one side of his head and birds are probably really require that. So if he were in the wild, he would not be able to hunt. He would have a hard time missing um, other, uh, th like things like cars, because they do get hit by cars a lot. And one of the main reasons why they are so often struck by cars is because they love to eat roadkill. Many birds of prey do, so it's such an easy meal. They'll swoop down, maybe get a dead squirrel, dead chipmunk, dead mouse, rabbit, and while they're swooping down for it, they might get struck by a car that's also flying or driving by. So it does not, um, it's very unfortunate. It happens often. So a lot of times if you see a dead bird of prey on the side of the road, if you look around, there may be another dead animal nearby as well. That was probably the cause of why that bird of prey had originally gone um, down and swooped and got hit by a car itself. All right, um, so that is it for the red-tailed hawk. This next bird is a great horned owl. So great horned owls are found also all over North America, but especially this Northeast region, you'll be seeing a lot of great horned owls. Um, the tough thing is you might actually not see them. We have them very prominently around here, but they are amazing at camouflage. If this guy were standing in the forest behind us, he would blend right in. And that is because he has the perfect colors to match our environment. They have lots of browns and whites and blacks on their body that are gonna mimic the sunlight, the shadow, the branches, leaves. So they're really gonna blend right in and camouflage into their surroundings. 
great horned owls get their name because on the top of their head, you can kind of see it on the, from the back, they have two big tufts of feathers. Those tufts are used to help with wind detection. So as those tufts blow in the wind, it tells the owl that um, they might need to maneuver a little bit differently, make some adjustments to better aim and better fly. All right, great horned owls also have massive talons. If you notice, those are right around the branch right now. Those talons are how they're gonna be able to kill their prey. So they're gonna swoop down, grab their prey, and they're gonna give a devastating grab um, that could just kill them right from grabbing them. All right, owls are also known for their silent flight. So as he flies around, it really makes no sound. Other birds of prey, like the hawk, do make sounds. You're gonna hear them flapping, but owls make no sound at all. It's just based on how their wings and feathers are all positioned. This one has very large yellow eyes. If an owl has lighter colored eyes, like the color yellow or orange, that means that it's likely active during the day. It could be active at night as well, but it, it's, and maybe it's gonna be a bit more active at night, but it can be active during the day, I should say. All right, so a lighter eye is gonna allow um, less light in, so it's gonna be less damaging to their vision if they were to be active when the bright sun is out. If an owl has very dark eyes, like a barred owl, those very black eyes are gonna allow in so much light at nighttime to help with night vision that they're gonna have um, a difficult time being active during the day because it's really gonna be painful to have their vision, um, the sun right in their vision, okay? Barred owls oftentimes are just going to be resting on a branch because of those dark eyes. Well, this guy here is going to be a little bit more elusive. They don't need to sleep all day, so they might be moving all around, kind of exploring um, and finding another spot to hide. All right. Um, and you can see he's rotating his head a lot. Owls are able to rotate their head about 270 degrees. That's going to allow them to have a wider field of vision, up to 360 degrees of vision. They cannot rotate their head 360 because it would severely damage their neck, but the 270 degrees of uh, rotation that they do have gives them all the vision that they need. All right, and the reason they have to rotate their heads is because their eyes are so big that they cannot move in the socket. They are stuck in place. So if they were to try, um, if they couldn't move their neck that much, they would just be staring straight forward and maybe shoulder to shoulder, kind of what we could do. But they have 14 vertebrae in their neck, which is uh, compared to our almost seven vertebrae in the neck. So it's gonna give them that um, added rotation since their eyes cannot move. Um, and the tough thing about owls, they're always depicted as the birds of wisdom, but they are actually not the brightest. Their instincts are unmatched, I would say. They are amazing at what they do, but there's not a lot of thought process or thinking behind it. They don't have the brain capacity similar to like a, uh, maybe a crow or any other corvid or the even a parrot. So their intelligence is just a bit different. And that's because their eyes take up so much of the skull space that there's not a lot of room remaining for a brain. And that's just how it goes for owls. Um, nothing against them. They're gonna hunt a lot better than many other birds, um, but it's just how they are built. And we got this one also from Georgia. So this one was probably struck by a car as well. Um, and there's no uh, clear injuries just looking at him, but it seems like there might be some neurological effects that went wrong. So this one probably wouldn't have been able to survive well in the wild either. So that's why we took it in. So I believe I mentioned it earlier, but we can take birds of prey in from the wild that are non-releasable we could not really take many other mammals from the wild. So that's just how, um, the, based on the permits that we have, we're able to get these different birds of prey to give them a nice permanent home if they cannot survive out in the wild. All right, so this was the Great Horned Owl. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us for this North America series. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys in some of our other series. I hope you enjoyed. And a huge thank you to the Killingly Library for hosting us for all of these series this time around. All right, thank you very much.